What time is it? Gotta watch him. I think the genius of, of John Waters, particularly in the beginning, was that he was able to push that envelope of good, bad taste, of, do, of, of putting things in his movies that if you describe them, uh, if they were reviewed by a film reviewer, people would say, absolutely hideous, under no condition would I consider this art or entertainment. I mean, John is consciously stabbing every social convention, uh, everything that would mortify any self-respecting uh, citizen in America. The way I saw Pink Flamingos was basically um, a reflection of our society. Can you imagine if Pink Flamingos was tested, or if I had had to pitch it to somebody, or they did market testing on it, say who would be the audience for Pink Flamingos? What, killers? I'd had friends that had um, had Pink Flamingo parties where they would, you know, dye all the pasta pink and dye the uh, dental floss pink and string it around the table so that there could be a communal flossing after the meal, and then they would all go see the movie. I think the last time I saw Pink Flamingos was about a year ago, and I think that it's more brilliant each time I see it. I am a nice middle-aged lady from South Dakota, and I am now looking at Pink Flamingos. Well, I thought it was hilarious, and I was laughing very hard, but wondering exactly where I was in relation to the universe. After going to see Pink Flamingos uh, three or four weekends, I uh, invited this girl to go with me to see it, who, who seemed to be like flirting with me uh, in, in class. She hated it so much that uh, it totally destroyed whatever potential relationship might have occurred with this girl. They're just great to see what, you know, 1972 looked like in Baltimore, you know. I mean, who else was doing that? <laughs> There was a story that he didn't want Kathleen to see uh, to see this picture that you're talking about. Um, Pink flamingos. Pink flamingos. But and I'm pretty sure he didn't want me to see it either. And I have never seen it. I'm, I believe she has seen it though. I thought it was absolutely hideous. You know, I mean, Lord of mercy, poor divine. <laughs> I wish you got the correct applause. Well, the port's all right. It's all the joints are in the water. We had looking for fat girls that were young that could dance. There was not hardly any that would even audition. We couldn't find anybody anywhere. Um, finally, when I saw Ricky the first time, she walked in. I said, can you dance? She jumped up and started dancing. She read the dialogue privilege. I knew it was Ricky. I was applying for a job at The Gap, a summer job. I was uh, going to take six months off from my um, college education to try and see what I could get showbiz-wise. And I was looking to work at The Gap in my local you know, town, and they wouldn't even call me for an interview. So uh, yeah, I was desperate. And luckily, thank God, this, this, this job came along and saved me. Working with Divine was fantastic. Um, he was he was a consummate professional. I remember, you know, it was it was the summer of 1987. There were cicadas everywhere. It was you know in Baltimore in the summertime. It's it's 100 degree you know with with 100 percent humidity. It's just nasty. And we were shooting these little tiny stores and little tiny sets. And he would sweat because he had the wig on and the makeup covering his beard. And it was. He never complained. I never heard him once complain. He always had, always had the best attitude, and I think I, I learned so much about 
you know, how to be a professional and how to how to work in this business by watching him and watching John. Carlson, how did Baltimore get his name? That's the room by the shop. Right, let's see how far you got. All right, sure. Meet us in lavatory next period. Bring magic school things. All right. Okay. Okay, try it again. Action. Wilson, true or false? Baltimore does sometimes go to Hot Country City. Oh, my God. Female Trouble was the first film of John's I saw. And it continues to be, I think, my favorite from the older films. Why is that? I just love Dawn, Dawn Davenport. She was, you know, genius. <laughs> she, she had the cha-cha heels. She had the look. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why that's my favorite. I, I like the story, I think, the best. I think Female Trouble is the best of my earliest films. It's the ultimate divine vehicle. And I made vehicles for divine, and I, and I think he knew that. In 1965, I was hired by the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, to begin their first film and video department. The film was very popular, had a lot of students, and had a lot of equipment. And had that equipment available, not just for the students, but found ways to let other filmmakers have access to that equipment. And John wanted to know if, if we could be his production crew for a female program. We set up the shots, we set up the camera angles, we set up the lights, in a way, my crew, my students, were his uh, crew for that film. It was like um, a family affair. Everybody just kind of like got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and showed up. And uh, doing hair was what I did. So I just kind of jumped in and grabbed a rat tail comb and a can of hairspray and sat Devon down in a chair with a wig. And away we went. That was it. I had a friend named Carol Warren. I didn't have a friend. She moved up the street from my parents, and I saw her, and she had like, she looked like Dawn Davenport. That's who I based it on. She had the same hairdo as Divine in the beginning of Female Trouble, only it was bleached white, but it had turned green from the chlorine in swimming pools, and she had a lot of, and she wore short shorts, and she had mosquito bites all over her leg, and I thought, ooh, I gotta meet her, right? And we became friends, and she knew Divine, who was then Glenn, who lived across the street with his parents, who had a nursery school which was, Divine was their only son. It was an odd <laughs> advertisement for a nursery school. When we did Female Trouble, there, the hair really, we didn't have to research anything for the, for the hair in that. Basically, the hair in Female Trouble just needed to be big and wide and big and wide. That was it. There is nothing <clears throat> that any human being can do in the society in which we live that is more a clear and direct means of self-expression than their hairdo. A lot of it was shot above my store on Reed Street. As a matter of fact, uh, two of the two of the sets were there, and we had to we had to close the business at Christmas time because when we tried to. Uh, do our retail business on the first floor while we were shooting on the second floor. The customers were making too much noise and the sound was picking it up, so we had to put a sign on the, on the door, close, please do not knock. There was a lot of metal work in Female Trouble because my brothers and I had started a metal company. It was just that, that is what was available at the moment. And, and then once I got out of the business, there's not much metal in John's movies. <laughs> But the birdcage was fun, and it now sits in my, my yard as an arbor in my garden. So I'm over here, um, looking at this stuff, you know, like, make it. See, when you flip it, you go. Like that? No, don't oh, do well, that. Oh, that's why I said that. Yeah. Now. Like, click it. Yeah, like that. Like, look at it. Adjusting for your hook. Yeah, that's the first. So I guess you can call, um, you know, biting off an umbilical cord and having a baby and spitting on the wall bad taste. But in effect, I don't think they were bad taste. I, I think they were good bad taste, which put it into a different realm of certainly humor. And nothing is in bad taste if it makes you laugh. As soon as you see David come out, be quiet. He says, I'd like to introduce the fabulous Don Davenport. 
When you, when you see her come out, just start clapping wildly, you know? And then she's going to run around the stage, keep clapping until she jumps up, she goes like this, two boys come over, help her on the trampoline, then die down. Okay, we're going to have a rehearsal, a rehearsal before we shoot it now. Now you wait till you hear action and then uh, start. But let me say action, let it clear my voice to hear the last syllable and then start, okay? I got him lessons at the YMCA. No, the, y, the y, YMCA, yes, um, in Druid Hill Park, near where I lived. And uh, Mr. Castor, that was the man's name, I still remember, who was his instructor. And he didn't know anything about a movie or Divine Being in Drag or anything. He just had to teach him how to do a flip. So he went every day, and Divine would practice with him. And then Mr. Castor had to show up the day we shot it and saw Divine in full drag and everything. And was just started laughing. And then run over here at the trampoline. Oh, that scared the shit out of me. The first couple of times I went, it was all right. I mean, I'm not a very physical person. I like swimming, and I, I ride and things. So here I was doing something that I said I would do. Um, the first couple of times it was all right, and the next time I went, I fell through the springs, I almost fell off and cut my legs all off. That freaked me out. So the next time I went, I was starting to do that backflip, and I fell on my face. So that's when I did not want to go back at all. And it was just, it was, I was scared. But I was, just, I was glad I would not see him as ever. So I was glad I did it. All right, Leroy is going to be the conductor of the audience. So on the first shot, just watch him. He'll tell you when to uh, react. Tell me one more time. athletic person. He avoided gym class all his life. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 I think it was a little tough for him, but he did it pretty well. <laughs> now listen, everybody keep quiet. I'm going to fire one shot in here if you all know how loud this is going to be. In other words, you're probably most going to want to hold your ear because it might be louder than you think. Well, that's why I brought these along. Now here we go. Bob, you ready? Bob. Okay, you all ready? Yeah. For me, that was my last cameo in a John Waters film, because I died for art. John Devine shoots me in that scene. And then after that, I, I thought, I've been embarrassed enough in my life in John Waters films, so I think I'll just stay behind camera. The movies were vehicles for Divine's beauty and my mental illness, really. My words were written for Divine and spoken through him. Divine had the anger. It was there to use. At first, he didn't quite get it. Divine was not political. Divine could, was anything but a hippie, believe me. Desperate Living stars uh, Mink Stoll as Peggy Gravel a uh, suburban housewife who leaves her home with her 400-pound housekeeper-turned-lesbian lover and takes her to a criminal commune run by the evil Queen Carlotta, played by Edith Massey. Well, Desperate Living was an all-female cast, except for the goons. I mean, I had to have some men in there in tight pants, you know? So, I mean, all the goons have fake boxes, so you can say they have, like, fake penises under their pants. I played one of the goons, uh, one of the marshals of, of the town, Mortville. And we were the guys that uh, gave our allegiance to Queen Carlotta uh, on a continuing basis. And uh, we made sure that uh, there was law and order in Mortville. Devon was doing one of the plays at the time, Neon Woman, I think, and had a contract. Um, he was going to be in it, certainly. I think he wanted to get away from me for a bit at the time. And he had a hit play actually at the time that it was something that didn't have to do with me which i understand certainly in hindsight we weren't fighting or anything um 
It was a shock to me at the time, but I certainly made the movie. I've done several films, but uh, I have to say that Desperate Living was my favorite. Uh, the, uh, the set was great. Uh, the people, you know, I, I think this is probably John's last kind of really gritty film. Um, so that's kind of neat to have been involved in that. A friend of his, well, in John's building, he knew this guy named Sonny who told us that I got a woman, I think, that would be a good part in your movies. And he asked, was I fat and so and so and so and so. So he told him to bring him down to meet me, bring me down to meet him. And when I went down to meet him, I was so, I don't know, I, I don't know what I was thinking, but at, whenever I'm uncomfortable, I do something stupid. So I grabbed his dick and said, hello. <laughs> uh, Gene Hill, you know, 400 pound lesbian lover in a tutu with Black Jack Purcell's on, <laughs> big red ruby lips all made up. You know, I saw her, man. That was it. I was in love. One of the reasons I enjoy working with him, he, I always say, when I'm ready, I'll say I'm ready. He never says, I hear him tell some people, get out there and go do your thing. But when you come from the stage, you get ready and you go on. See, and I didn't know at the time in the movies that you had a chance to even make a mistake. That's why I made sure that I knew every line and everything that you had to know. You know, I, I guess the highlight for me was uh, Dean Hill uh, throwing me through the, you know, killing me, throwing me through the building. He took the name Desperate Living from an underground women's magazine here in Baltimore, and um, it had become defunct right before the film was released. And I remember physically having an altercation with the publisher of that magazine because I was um, advertising Desperate Living, the film, in a, uh, in a bar that I was running at the time. Oddly enough, when the movie came out, lesbians stopped it from being shown. In Boston, at the Orson Welles Cinema, militant lesbian groups had said, how dare a man make a movie about lesbians? And today, when I go to the colleges, um, lesbians like that movie the best. Desperate Living was probably his best example of, like, working the... Um, the lesbian and gay community uh, with, uh, you know, Sue Lowe as Mole McHenry and um, that whole business with Liz Renee and sex changes and, I mean, it's just all so bizarre anyway. And, I mean, he just has a way of taking something that is already bizarre and making it even more bizarre. Liz Renee was always the first choice. She was always going, it was Susan Lowe that came in, the understudy to play Mole. No, this, it never was Divine going to play the Liz Renee part? Divine was always going to play the mole part, play the butch lesbian, and Liz Renee was always going to play that part. A lot of people see Desperate Living now and think Sue just looked like that, but it was based really on this woman we did know that we used to see in Sherry Showbar that was so scary, that really looked like that. She was the scariest lesbian. And she made Johnny Cash would have cried if he saw her, you know. She was the butchest woman I ever saw in my life. And um, we based it on her and Sue knew her. So I called to him and I said, you know, you, would you do this part? I, I must admit, you're going to have to transform yourself into something pretty hideous at the time. And she said, fun. She's a great sport. She bleached her hair. Cut out her children, though, went berserk when they saw her. <laughs> Started sobbing. I don't think it did a lot for her love life. I created Mole from my memory as a tomboy and what I thought would be really cool as a tomboy, you know. And that's the basis for Mo McHenry. And it was difficult, but I kind of found the Mo McHenry, and I kind of really enjoyed being Mo McHenry. I kind of enjoyed being, having the power of being um, a guy. Butch, femme, lesbian, biker, white, trash, uh, mall rat, those, all those things are fertile, bad taste uh, grounds. They're, they're all, they are, I don't think you could probably be in good taste and really be successful in any one of those endeavors. Certainly, I imagine that I'm the white trash aesthetic <laughs> that works through John. John, I mean, John didn't grow up white trash, but I, I grew up a lot closer to that situation. So as far as the look goes, I know what I'm talking about. I would never, ever say the word white trash. I think it's the last politically correct racist term to use, and I, I would never say it. It's a condescending term. It means you are better than they are. 
I know what you mean by it, but I, I don't think of it as white trash in my movies. I think of it as extreme white people. I believe that was... Now, I don't take offense when people say my films are in bad taste. Certainly, uh, bad taste is a color I paint with. <laughs> well, you better give us our share. We need money. We're not trash like you. Good bad taste is is putting it in a different context, is turning bad taste around so it actually becomes good taste because of humor and hopefully wit and, and looking at things with a new kind of respect. That's good bad taste. Bad, bad taste, as I said before, is just stupidity and offensiveness without being clever. John and I both have this love for early Disney films and, and certainly for all the villains and stuff. Uh, he's always like like making these fables and and uh, Desperate Living was probably the closest one to that kind of thing. Mink's costume of completely inspired by Snow White, the Wicked Witch. I used to have a picture of that witch in my bedroom for you. To maybe still, I think she's up there. Um, I, you know, I love that character. Certainly Disney, I always said, was a big influence on all my movies. All the Disney villains were the best. You know, one of the things that you don't hear a lot about Disney World is all of the people who come down here to commit suicide because it's supposed to be the happiest place on earth. I mean, that's their slogan. And yet, and because of that... People want to give the finger to And people want to say, well, F you. You know, I'm not happy. I'm going to off myself right here. And I love that. That's the one thing about Disney World that I just love. <laughs> all, all I can really do is make the playground for the cinematographer and the actors. And the, the more convincing I can make it, I think the better that the better that they don't have to make compromises and the actors feel in the right mood for their parts. It's not just what you see on the screen, it's the environment of filming that means a lot. On Desperate Living, I became the guy who held the zoom so he couldn't zoom in and out on everything. That was my big job, to just sit beside him and hold the zoom from moving in and out. Because we were trying to get him to not, you know, make everything one take, move the camera all over the place. So we're, and he wanted us to do that, so, you know. It was fine when I would do that to him. He knew exactly what he wanted, uh, all the way through the film, before we ever started. And I'd never worked with a director with that kind of vision or that kind of understanding of the project. Um, so that impressed me at the time, because this was a new thing. And it was, it was apparent that he was crafting a film that he had in his head. It was already his film. All I was going to do is help him get it on film, help him get it exposed and processed, and give him something tangible to work with. It was his movie in his head, you know, before we ever started. The first ad campaign for Desperate Living was the rat on the plate. And um, Alan Rose did the original shot here. And it was a very hard shot. It was an overhead looking right down at the rat. And we really did cook the rat with, in someone's kitchen in their oven who we were fighting with that we didn't like. He's no longer alive, so it doesn't really matter. But um, and boy, does it stink when you cook a rat. I'm telling you, Vince did it. And I'm telling you, there's no odor, like you know, as a baked rat. And believe me, that person had some foul moves from foul meals ever since, because how you could never get rid of that smell out of an oven. The New York Times rejected the ad. They wouldn't have a rat on the plate. So we did the other ad with Liz Renee with her breasts hanging out, screaming, which to me looks much more obscene, like a rat on a plate you can't have, but a woman being tortured with her tits showing, you can. Seems like an odd... Um, odd policy in the advertising department. But um, yes, and so there were two ad campaigns. The rat on the plate seemed to be especially a turnoff for liberal upscale readers. I came from a, a pretty conservative religious upbringing. And uh, in fact, when my, my mother heard I was gonna do a film with John Waters, she knew enough to know that this was out of our family's normal stream of uh, experience. Um, but um, when I went there uh, and started working on the film and meeting, uh, meeting the actors and actresses. They were normal people. What we were doing was a fantasy. It w really wasn't, uh, wasn't very shocking or surprising even, really. To the connoisseur of bad taste, there are certain objects, certain specific objects, modes of behavior, hairstyles, fashions, that um, are kind of a delicious, wonderful, outlaw bad taste because they have that certain way of kind of a pâté le bourgeois, uh, and yet they're, and yet they're not just vulgar. There's there's more to them, um, and that's a very hard thing to define, but it's there.
They all made money from the greeting cards at the time, which was great. Petey and Gene Hill both did. They were models. That's what they were. They all became models. And um, they certainly had untraditional looks for being a model. about to see a preview of the most fantastic advance ever to be made in the history of motion picture entertainment, called HypnoVista. It is a psychological technique whereby you, seated in the auditorium, actually become part of the action you see on the screen. Macabre. When you came in the theater, you had to sign an insurance policy that you died of fright and William Castle at the premiere would get out of the hearse in a coffin, climb out of a coffin. And the tingler with the buzzers that went off the seat and the house of Haunted Hill where the skeleton came across the audience. William Castle's, his showmanship, his, his having a personality as a director that the public knew, um, the fact that he made fun of a genre himself by parroting it, but the children didn't know it. They loved it. It was a way to get kids to go. It made the movie, even if the movie was bad, it made it fun. And um, he was a giant influence on my life, certainly. And the smell movies, which I never saw, because I, don't, I think they were very unsuccessful. The Scent of Mystery was the first one, which was the big one. And they had the big machine in the theater that pumped the smells out. But uh, they couldn't get, and it was all good smells. But they, after five shows a day, they couldn't. The theater stunk so bad when you walk in, people almost passed out. And it was a bad travelogue, really, with, you know, smells of apple blossoms and stuff. All right, now this is the product of our endless experimentation. Mm, the Odorama card. On a Sunday morning, I got a call from John Waters. Conversation. Uh, hello, this is John Waters. Yes. Uh, do you do you know me? Well, I I know your work. Um, well, oh, I'm in a bit of a jam. Could you come down to Johns Hopkins? I, I've rented a lab here, and do a piece for me. I said for a, a regular John Waters film. Yes. Well, my, my poor wife on Sunday morning was very nervous because I had a reputable job and I was on the faculty at Hopkins and this guy had a reputation for shock movies. You know, that's where it all began for him. So I said, and it was a little cheeky of me, I guess, I, I really don't want to kiss Divine. No problem, he says. Uh, I'd rather work alone. No problem, he says, and I don't want to eat any feces if it's okay with you, because he had that in one of his flicks. Okay, he says, no problem. So an hour later, I was driving down. Ah, now sniff it, number one. Yeah, see, you get it, you smell it, yeah, it works. By God, it actually works. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Odorama. Huh? Odorama was basically just another joke in the movie Polyester. It was, you got a card that had numbers one to ten when you went into the theater. And I've seen them in many languages. And in Mexico, sadly, they were all crooked because they were put on in sweatshops instead of machines. Um, when that number appeared on the screen, you scratch and sniff that number. And I saw audiences all over the world pay me money to smell shit. They would hear a fart, they'd see the number, and they'd still pick up the car. What did they think it was going to smell like? <laughs> Polyester certainly was the first movie that was thought of to be not a midnight movie, to be an R-rated movie. And it was when midnight movies were ending. It was really, I knew that things had to change if I was going to keep going. You know, I've been doing it for 10 years. They've been popular. You had to, had to keep changing. You had to keep kind of paying attention to what time you were living in and, and how the movie business worked and where you could play. It's always hard for my movies to get screened, so you got to at least figure out which screens to go after. It's sort of silly to try to get screens that aren't there anymore. I said, so what do you want it to look like? And he said, well, go see, you know, Written on the Wind, uh, uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, Russ Meyer movies and Douglas Sirk movies. He'd love it to look like that. Douglas Sirk himself was one of the great, great connoisseurs of taste, good and bad. And uh, for a long time, before he was sort of rediscovered by cineasts, his films were considered in extreme bad taste. There were women's weepies, they starred Rock Hudson, Lana Turner, the plot convolutions were ridiculous. But at some point, people began to look at them and realize there was a higher consciousness at work, and he was playing with all of these icons of bad taste and creating a really profound commentary on 
the society out of which those icons were plucked. Brothers are the first people I ever heard that told me about Douglas Sirk. They used to talk about in their early things, loving those movies. And really, Fassbender is the person that revived Douglas Sirk's career for all of um, film buffs, really. He was thought of as a woman's director, and they used that in a bad way. He was thought of as making bad commercial Hollywood movies that were weepies and melodramas. Um, he's still one of my favorite directors. I actually met him with Fassbender in, at the Berlin Film Festival. And he told me he liked Pink Flamingos, and I was so speechless, I felt like falling to my knees in front of him, like, ah. Um, I still love Douglas Sirk. And certainly, um, I wanted to use, since Douglas Sirk did make his greatest movies, I think, about suburban um, people trapped in suburbia and the irony and the hypocrisy of suburbia. Um, I certainly wanted Dave to watch all those movies and, and, and imitate them in a comic way, the kind of lighting that came from that, from no possible source, that very theatrical lighting. John loved all that, so we tried to put, uh, a, we tried to put direct light through every window, and so the lighting made no um, practical sense, but it made uh, you know, theatrical sense for, for the movie. You know, it was just, it was fun lighting. I think that's why we're all insane in love, because we were raised to believe this is what love is supposed to be like. So no wonder we're all nuts. It was completely impossible for that kind of romance that was in those movies to ever be real. A lot of John's jokes about suburban life and jokes about American culture and all those taboos are still funny. Polyester was definitely suburbia. You know, it was... It was our take on suburbia and our satire on it. However, it was, it was real enough that when we finished the film and had a yard sale in, in front, all the neighbors bought all the furniture, so I figured we, we got it right. I think polyester is one of his great titles, just because if there was ever one word that, yeah. that was the quintessential symbol of bad taste, it was polyester. Polyester then was very different now. Polyester is very cool for kids to wear. There, then, it was the exact opposite of cool. It's completely in 10 years changed its opinion. Every young people I know loathe natural fabrics. They love the more hideous polyester they can wear the coolest. Then, cotton was king. <laughs> um, really, that to wear polyester was the worst suburban, tackiest thing you could do at the time. And um, that's what it meant then. It's symbolizing a lifestyle of no irony in suburbia, where people were, to me, trapped in their polyester lifestyle. Today, the word polyester is completely different. It means cool kids in 70s revivals go to college and find great buys in thrift shops. The anti-pornographic and the anti-abortion uh, protesters in polyester and, 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 the, and, the, uh, and the racists in hairspray are the are the ones that have the are the easiest targets for uh, for John's mind. You bought this house for the profits of porno. Children are going to hell because of your theaters. What have you got to say to him? Children here draw a dollar fifty. Please show Benji! Please show G-Ray to Marty! Elmer, thank God you're home! Get off of me! Why haven't you notified the press? Think of the publicity! He knows where those people live. He goes to their doors and bangs on the doors, you know, and, and gets them to come out, and he exposes them as, uh, how, as, as extremely vulgar and in extreme bad taste. He manages to succeed in, in being outrageous. He promises to be outrageous somehow. The film promises you that, and the film escalates and, and is outrageous, and somehow isn't, um, I guess, mean-spirited or uh, misanthropic. <laughs> I get the feeling from watching 
these films that whoever makes them actually does like people a lot. I tried to make Flamingos Forever for three, that's why I didn't make a movie between Polyester and Hairspray, which is the longest I ever, never made a movie. And um, I believe me, through every movie I've ever made, I've never had a day off. So the moment one's over, I try to make the next one. All sorts of things happen, all sorts of problems. But I tried really a long time to make that movie. John uh, had presented Pink Flamingos to, to, to Michael Hers and me. And we very much liked the script. He, I believe he had a, a, uh, a deal that went with it. And we were, we were uh, going to support it uh, financially. And it was in the days when we actually had some real money to, 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 to spend. I, I think, I may be wrong, but I think we were the only uh, studio, if, if, if you will call us that, that supported uh, Pink Flamingos Part Two. But again, check with John. But I know we were really interested, and we, we were very eager to do it. Troma would have made it until I saw their editing rooms, and it was too scary. I thought, I don't know. I don't know about this. And um, New Line wouldn't, nobody would make the movie. He called me when I was on vacation down in Arkansas and said, how would you like to do a television disc jockey program? And I said, I don't know. What do we do while we play the records? He said, we'll think of something. You come on by the station as soon as you get back, and they, the, the bosses, the big guys, want to see what you do on television. I came home from, from school and watched the Buddy Dean show every day, danced in front of the TV religiously. Uh, I really knew what that was, that was about. And so it was like a catharsis back to, to my own teenagehood. Dick Clark and I didn't speak to each other. I didn't call Dick. Dick didn't call me. In fact, I tried to get him to play a record for me one time, and he wouldn't do it. We never saw Dick Clark here, ever. We had the Buddy Dean show, where the kids had higher hair, wore more eye makeup, had more extreme clothes. It was just pushed one step a little further than American Bandstand. Now, I exaggerated in my head. I used to watch it every day and then go home and draw the committee members on the show and imagine fictitious biographies on the back, how they burned down the school and beat up here, made up criminal biographies of them. Totally not true. But I would let my imagination get carried away with it. But Certainly, in my neighborhood, it was not cool to be on the Buddy Dean show, but everyone watched it and made fun of it, but I loved it. We ended up lighting all the dance studio stuff as if it was a TV set. So we ended up even going so far as getting old lighting fixtures that they used in the 50s and 60s in the TV studios. best dancer of all the little dancers. They were all skinny and cute and young, and, and I was, you know, the overweight one that had to be better. So I had to, not only was I working in every scene in the movie, I was also having dance rehearsals off camera. Um, every time that I wasn't on screen, I was on the side, you know, practicing the mashed potato and stuff. And I, I think I lost like 20 pounds like that because I'm not, I wasn't used to exercising. And they would feed me dove bars, you know, they would call it fat patrol. Vine would chase me around with a dove bar to try to put on weight so that the continuity would, would match. Hey, you! Can I ask you a personal question? No, you can't. Is your daughter mulatto? I actually tried to do what Divine did because Divine was very elegant and soft and, and sort of sophisticated about delivering those lines that were totally impossible. And the reason that they became so 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 preposterous was, was because of Divine's physical self. Now, my physical self doesn't really come close to being so exaggerated as, as Divine's was. So, you know, I sort of had to hone it down somehow within myself and, and make this, you know, appear to be like a person, you know, a real person, somehow, I, I don't know, I, 
in my, my little world, I had to do that. It is true that Baltimore at the time was incredibly racially tense. It was when everything was becoming integrated. Um, the Buddy Dean show, it did happen. With the, they didn't know what to do about it because the, it was all black music with white kids dancing to it. We had gotten bomb threats. We gotten had to close the show down a couple of times. Had to get everybody off the set several times. And the police had to come in and investigate. Bunch of nobody's, but this was going around a little bit. And the white kids on the show would have let blacks come on and dance with. It was their parents who wouldn't allow that kind of integration, which was unheard of at the time. Most of the kids said, it doesn't matter to us, but our parents won't let us come. They're not going to let us come anymore. Well, he said, really? They said, no, sir, he won't let us come. So I didn't know it, but at that point, that's when they decided that the show was over. I think John really captured that uh, sneaky racism and hypocrisy and uh, people trying to look like uh, they're fine, upstanding citizens, but, but, but right under the surface, they're just they're racists crawling with maggots. All the kids that were famous on The Buddy Dean Show, when they would go to the record hops for personal appearance, they never knew if they were going to get beat up or sign autographs. It was one of the two. They were hated and loved, and that appealed to me very much. You know, I think that was the kind of movie stars I had. You never knew if they were going to sign autographs or get arrested. To Madison, that was done quite well in Hairspray, and uh, it, it really broke out here in Baltimore, and uh, we still do it today at Record Tops. The Buffon is the extreme expressionist among us, the person who does the bouffant. For one thing, to create a bouffant is a huge amount of work. The male version of bouffants, which were, you know, these grilled cream monstrosities. And I remember, like, staring at them in homeroom or, you know, classes that I was dreaming through and seeing, like, these big sort of wads of dandruff, like, clinging to the <laughs> Vaseline and thinking this was, like, so incredibly sexy. So, I mean, I, I guess it's like certain African tribes, you know, putting dung in their hair, you know. I mean, I guess this is our, you know, our little culture. Our dung. Our dung, <laughs> right? That was a weird time. It was before the Beatles, it was before hippies, but it was after Elvis, and it was this weird time when the fashions were the most insane. Those giant beehive hairdos were not the rebel look. That's how your mother looked, too. In certain neighborhoods of Baltimore, they had mother-daughter look like. That wasn't the way to rebel. The way to rebel was to have straight ironed hair. So um, it was a very confusing time for fashion in Baltimore. One, two, cha-cha-cha. I had some new campaign flyers made up today. All for Daddy's little girl. Now, I want you to hand those out at the hop tonight to everyone, each and every one of those. Twist. Oh, Daddy, no lip from you, Miss Ingrate. This campaign is costing us an arm and a leg. New gowns, hairdresser three times a week. Why, your hairspray bill alone is enough to eat up all the profits from the tilt a whirl. I was fascinated with the, the Sonny Bono mystique and history and all the stuff that he'd done and um, him being such a, um, a bizarre character on his own. Anybody who can, you know, hustle singles <laughs> in the record business. I mean, the mind boggles. He, he was fan he's fantastic. He could have been um, uh, any number of those characters. I mean, any, you know, any one of them. He could have done the, the, the Corny Collins show, or, you know. I mean, he, he would have been the great, a great MC. I mean, he could have played any number of those parts. He's such a, such a character. I remember Divine walked on the set that they dressed like that and said, no one can ever call me a drag queen again. What drag queen would allow themselves to look like that? And he's right. That's acting. That ain't drag.
when we were on cloud nine from great reviews from hairspray so the timing was off and it was just unbelievable that he was that he just didn't wake up unbelievable that that happened to him at so uh, young an age so i just remember talking to john on the phone and and going over to his house and we all just pat and and Van and John and I sat around in his bedroom and we, we just listened to message after message coming in from all over the world, really, you know. Uh, and it was a, it was hard to even realize because Divine was bigger than life, you know, and, and right in the middle of his stride, you know, that his life would just end that abruptly. And really that quietly, I mean, he just didn't wake up. It was just so weird and so terrible and so, and then the movie was a hit and it was, but you couldn't be happy it was a hit because, it, I don't know, it was, uh, it was a very, I guess, um, that's when I became an adult. It was like six days or something after the movie opened and, um, um, I got a phone call from the publicist and they told me, and I, I was in shock. It was really um, so tragic to, to, you know, the timing was such that it was just, he was like making it, you know, it was, everything was coming together for him and it was just such a shame that, that he couldn't live to see the success of the movie and, and who knows what he would be doing these days. I would imagine great things. There were people there like, fans like trying to throw themselves in the coffin on the funeral parlor. <laughs> it was... It was like imitation of life, a funeral in that. And the one good thing I can remember, it brought Telson to a standstill, the town that hated him when he was a teenager. That was something, kind of, not a reason to die for, but that's all I could remember. Look at this, the entire town, this little village here is in a, stopped because of this for somebody that, you know, they gave a lot of hassle to 20 years before that. Javon was slated to do, like, Married with Children. He was out in L.A., and uh, all of a sudden, that was it. And the, we, I remember at the funeral, Flowers from uh, Married with Children said, if you didn't want to be in the show, why didn't you just tell us? I think you only get one divine per lifetime. I mean, I don't think, you know, you just put the cast and call out and say, you know, please send me another 375 pound drag queen because it's not that easy. I mean, Divine really had the Divine spark, and um, she was um, truly bigger than life. I mean, she was she was a star in the way that I I honestly can't think of anybody since the 1950s who I would say is a star. I mean, she really was the last star that I think of had that. That, that that total charisma where when she was on screen that's all you could look at. Gonna get together and dance all night and do some talking all the moon is bright. So get your date and don't be late. Pajama party tonight. Uh -huh. Pajama party tonight. I never liked those movies that much. You know, they were too corny for me. Um, and I had taken drugs by the time those movies came out. So basically, no. I, I think they were more... Well, I was making fun of those kind of movies, certainly. I, I knew those movies, but I didn't see every one of every beach party movie or everything. I liked them because I liked Annette and I liked Frankie Avalon, but I wanted something more edge to happen with them. They were too corny, I think. On Cry Baby, uh, our grand scheme was... Uh the 50s motorcycle movies, uh, bad boy movies, all those B movies that I don't know the titles of, but bad boy, bad girl movies. I remember watching a bunch of those. Anyone here older than me, it was before my time, um, any 60-year-old in Baltimore in the U.S., were you a Draper or a Square without batting an eye, I'll tell you. And it meant if you, a preppy or a hood. Now, of course, my sympathies were with the hoods. I tried to have a drape hairdo, but even then, my hair just didn't work in a drape hairdo. <laughs> you had to have, like, thick hair, like, you know, have a pompadour and stuff. I had the most pitiful pompadour. Crybaby was my Elvis movie, certainly. 
And that was what I was trying to do with that. Glorify um, a genre of movie that was almost unknown at the time we made that movie. I mean, you had to be certainly old enough to have seen an Elvis movie. And no one liked Elvis movies, even when they came out. When you're hitchhiking, look down there, look over this road. Look and she's basically this bombshell who is very, very sexy on the outside. And so she plays up to it. And she uses it to embarrass people and to get things that she wants. What? She does things that would embarrass me. <laughs> Stand by. I think Tracy looks great. She can have fun with playing a bad girl who underneath it all really isn't a bad girl, which is what the character is. I've seen some of John's really early films, and they are quite interesting. So yeah, I was looking forward to working with him, but at the same time, I was a little nervous about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically, his direction to me was, be more youthful. I've always been sort of ahead of myself. And it was very, probably the most difficult part about this role. The, the sexuality was so easy for me. I didn't think twice about it. I, you know, I thought about how I wanted her to move and the physicality of it. But basically, that was, that was very easy for me. But the, the innocence, the youth, was very difficult for me. The cast of Crybaby was pretty diverse. I mean, Tracy had only acted in porn films. So she was coming from a totally different background. Uh, she w had the FBI on the set subpoenaing her. Um, you know, I'd never acted in films before. It was an unusual cat situation on the set of Crybaby, I think, for the entire cast. Every Sunday night on television, people think that they know you. They put you in a category, and they, they try to make you stay there. But for me, it was important to do not what people expected. So I did a musical comedy. I'm learning to dance for this. I never danced before. I, I can't dance. Even when I was a kid, you know, I'd go to like, you know, we would, me and my friends would sort of sneak into the dances and stuff. And I never danced. I could never do it. I think he's uh, a wonderful actor, but just has that movie star magic. And I, when I call somebody a movie star, that's the biggest compliment I can give. There's a, a, a rapport and a sense of camaraderie on his films that just don't exist on other sets. Um, all the people have been working with him for, you know, 20, 30 years, their family. It really is like a family. Pat Moran is like my surrogate mother when I'm a, on set. Um, Van, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like, when I go back to Baltimore and work on a, one of his movies, it's like I never left. It really feels like home. Cry Baby was a lot of fun because it was a, a young cast. We all stayed together in one hotel. There was kind of a party every night downstairs. And uh, it was kind of like being in a college dorm or something. It was really fun. Hairspray, I was very young. I got in trouble for going to a bar one night. I was 18. I took, you know, Penny Pingleton, who was like 15 at the time, and we went out with some guys on the set, and we got in big trouble. But 20, I was, you know, I was 20 when we did Cry Baby, and I actually lost my virginity on that movie. Chip, honey? Thanks, Mom. Listen to this. Hillside Strangler gets his college degree in prison. That's nice, too. Nice? He should have been executed. Yeah, it's the death penalty. I killed people, Mom. We all have our bad days. You probably date him. He's cute. <laughs> all right, that's enough. Hey, Dad, have you ever seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer? The serial mom was our Martha Stewart look, or, or at least our satire of it. You know, but that was very hard. We really were tr trying to control ourselves and not get wild or burlesque about it and make it true to life for, you know, so that the people living in that area would see that film and, and feel comfortable about it, except for maybe they might do some murdering themselves. But. I don't even know if I knew who Martha Stewart was when I made Serial Mom, but yes, the perfection of cleanliness and perfect suburban living to me, yes, which would be my nightmare. Um, I like Martha Stewart, actually, um, because she must be such a control freak and such a... Uh, I, I just am fascinated by Martha Stewart. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to live like her. I don't use her tips. Although her cookbooks aren't bad. I've used them, and they're not bad. Um, but I don't think Martha Stewart's the enemy. Um, I think she could be serial mom, probably. I, 
I think Martha Stewart could maybe kill people, and it wouldn't be that big of a shock. All that perfection in her house must drive her insane. I had been sent the script to a serial mom. John had asked that I that I read the script, and I I tried. I I read it until I got to the point where she put the poker in the guy's back and pulled out his liver, and I I threw the thing down. I said, "This is." This is just nuts. And I, anyway, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So the next day, I picked it up, and I continued reading until she killed the woman with the leg of lamb, at which point I ran down the stairs to my husband and said, you're not going to believe this one. You're just, you're not going to believe this one. All I remember was his wanting everybody to be comfortable and in the desire to do that and to have a clear idea what was wanted of them, and in order to do that, we did some readings in his house. I think Sam had serious reservations about, uh, about the morality of the piece, whether or not we were glorifying, you know, serial killers or something, which John and I were continually saying to Sam, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. I swear to God, that's not what we're doing, you know. I think Serial Mom was a movie about how much fun it would really be to kill people that get on your nerves every day for the slightest thing with no kind of ever having to pay the piper. I mean, we're not reality where you had to feel guilt or anything. It's a great school, Dad. Well, your mother has PTA today. We'll see what your teacher has to say. Oh, Mom, I hate Mr. Stubbins. Don't say hate, dear. Hate is a very serious word. The rest of the first scene that was shooting some bizarre scene in the background that was, uh, I think, the lovemaking scenes between Kathleen Turner and, and Sam. And uh, that was, you know, we're filming flies and everything has to be quiet and still, and these stupid flies, and we're catching them with our hands and using them again because some flies were better than others. And in the background, you know, you're hearing this lovemaking sounds, and John's lovemaking sounds are always, oh, come on, baby, get it, get it, get it, get it. You know, <laughs> so hilarious. And, and we're filming flies landing on butter and coffee cups. That was one of the best nights of my life. <laughs> He's really quite strong about his script, about the dialogue. Uh, you don't go around improvising or saying, well, I'd rather use this word than that word. Uh, he's, he's quite sure of what he's written and appreciates that uh, you give him that trust. But when it came to how we would block out a scene and how we would shoot the actual assaults and stuff. He was uh, very willing to, to uh, share with that. You can't wear white shoes after Labor Day. That's not true anymore. The scene at the end of Serial Mom, where Kathleen kills me with a telephone. She was a great stunt woman that I'd never, I'd, I'd worked with so many. I'd never done a stunt before, and you have to learn how to take a punch. Kathleen, you know, comes out and takes the phone and measures the shot, and we begin to shoot. Please, fashion has changed. No, it hasn't. And she goes, great, someone who can take a punch. She took hits better than almost any stunt woman I'd worked with. And then, of course, I had this terrible thought afterwards, well, of course, she's really experienced this, you know. And I, 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 thought, I hope she took it as a compliment, because I meant it as one. I'm a firm believer that you should never, ever wear white, unless it's summer. Now, there's winter white, which is wool. There's, you know, there's kind of um, footnotes to these rules. <laughs> but still, basically, white shoes are tough to pull off any time of the year, if you want to know the truth, <laughs> except in the summer if you're on a boat. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. So, um... No, I'm just very right-wing on this particular issue, and I, it is a very big issue with me. If, if people really insist upon wearing white shoes outside of the proper dates, I can't be their friend. Things that appear, let's say, in high fashion magazines like Vogue or Harper's Bazaar, which normally were the domain of impeccable taste and impeccable beauty, um, you now see things that, you know, used to only be seen on a bondage dominatrix or in a tattoo parlor or um, a whore. And now it's high fashion. So whoever sets the, the limits, whoever the arbiters 
of bad taste has not made it easy um, to sort of get a good grasp on what is and what isn't. I do see him mostly as a social satirist, as someone exploding social conventions in a way that nobody else really does. And uh, I don't know what else to say. I just find him unbelievably funny in terms of delving into the perverse. He's kind of an inspiration to me, like the scene in uh, Serial Mom where the woman has her feet licked while she's watching Annie. You know, I mean, that just to me is a stroke of genius. You know, I mean, so many of the things he comes up with, it's easy to be perverse in a simple, stupid way, but he's, he's perverse in an ingenious way. Look at me. I am as normal as all of you. But I have been framed by the police and perjured against by the very people I thought were my friends. All I ask of you is that you have the courage to find me innocent of these terribly untrue charges. I mean, the whole phenomena of serial mom this business of her great acclaim, I mean, the, the fandom that was created around this, you know, regardless of the fact that she, what, she gained this notoriety because she was killing people. But, I mean, the, I, his, the concept that it doesn't matter why you get the attention, I mean, the media attention of the national, that simply having attained it is its own goal, uh, is I thought he handled that very well. I think both Female Trouble and Serial Mom were, were basically very different variations on the same point, that people look better under arrest. Get off! <laughs> Celebrity murder, people who become famous because they commit heinous crimes, or famous people who commit heinous crimes, are a really good example of the kind of bad taste that uh, has become more and more prevalent in the last 10 or 20 years, certainly in post-war America. Uh, I mean, it used to be that when a celebrity committed a crime, Fatty Arbuckle is the perfect example, they were really ostracized. They were not celebrities anymore for having committed that crime. Now that's not true, and I think the fact that it's not true is a very good example of how bad taste really permeates the mainstream culture as well as the fringe culture. Well, I think the, the, the obsession with criminal trials is kind of over now. As soon as I make a movie about something, it sometimes does end it. Um, I can't go to murder trials anymore. I've tried, and now people recognize me. And I'm always afraid that the jury will use it against the defendant and give them the death penalty because they hate my movies. So I don't go anymore. Yeah, death. Yeah. 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 I still... So, judge... Yeah. Here we go. Let's lock it up very quiet for rehearsal. <laughs> okay. And here we go, very quiet. And everyone else is mouthing in the background. And action. <coughs> and everybody in the scene, remember to not walk like a galoot. Bobby, what was she blocked by? Well, when she when she refers to the rap right. she yeah, moves to her right. Yeah, you can just go like that. You don't have to when you refer to the rap. Yeah. Did you go say everyone, please? Oh, okay, okay. Clear with that way, and then we'll just do the point of view there. Okay, okay. All right? So she just turns that way. And then you see Cindy right away. Right. Right, and there's Cindy turning. And then you take the picture. That's one of the things I really marveled about Pecker this time is I thought that the performances were such a um, a real leap forward for John because John tends to make everyone very um, you know caricatured and and campy almost to the point of like overkill and but this time I really felt that the characters were so believable but yet they were truly his characters you know it's like it really reached a new level of of water you know water mania <laughs> pecker is a movie that's about a boy who finds a camera at his mother's thrift shop and goes around taking pictures and he'll go taking pictures of everything he sees the idea was actually written into the script as far as the photographs were concerned but john let me 
do what I do, photographically speaking, uh, with the photographs as far as composition goes and, you know, lightness, darkness, and actually manipulating the photographs. He needed someone to play Rory, and, um, or he wanted me to play Rory and uh, Pecker. And, I mean, I've always loved John, and, um, I mean, I'd never met him personally, but I said, absolutely, I didn't even read the script. I just thought it was a funny title that people would remember. It was just another joke. It was like Odorama. It was like, I don't know, uh, Ouija. That's the name that I always thought before. It was a sort of <laughs> obscene-sounding photographer's name from the past, a one-word name that you could become famous with, uh, um, something to hang your fame on, like a one-word, Madonna, Cher, only a word that you would be slightly embarrassed to say. I told my parents about it, my mother said, but we heard that some people called it Johnson. I couldn't believe she said that. I kind of felt like I, there's a lot more for me to learn about Baltimore. I mean, I took, John took me on the tour. Did you? Yeah, which was great, but like, um, I want to know, I want to know more. I said always the pecker was about um, blue collar Baltimore and the New York art world and the curtain of irony that separates the two. And the curtain of irony begins just south of Philadelphia. As you cross over the Delaware Memorial Bridge, you start, you're irony free, but you feel irony in the air. You can tell that it's coming. And by the time you're, just before you hit Philadelphia, you are inside the curtain of irony. He comes full circle in Pecker and, and brings the bad taste, white trash elements that he, that he started on back to this place where he, you could see that his satirizing of them comes from the fact that he empathized with them so deeply. What you discover in Pecker is the true worth and, and the, 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 uh, the true dignity, where the, where the dignity really is. Well, it's not with the cultured New York art set, it's with the white trash, Hamden, you know, elements. John didn't want me to be or hear anything that was inappropriate for me. So when we were in um, his house, I got to go upstairs to watch TV in his room. And that was fun. I mean, I, could, I, just, I just love that he's, 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 he's a maverick. I mean, he's a power of example because he's been doing it his way, his truth, um, for all these years. And we need, we need those. We need those people. Mainstream, blah, blah, blah. but you know he didn't really. And if you if you look at his at his work, uh, it's 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 just reflecting exactly what's going on at the time. And uh, and what what there was to satirize in the '60s wasn't the same thing that there was to satirize and and uh, and get into in the '70s and '80s. You can't remain an underground filmmaker forever, particularly when there is no more underground, when everything that's underground has been brought to the surface by the contribution of John Waters, then he's got to take it now somewhere on the surface. So he's a person who's blended those things together and changed the mainstream forever accordingly. Pink Flamingos got busted last year in Florida in a video shop because a family goes in and said, we loved Hairspray, let's get another John Waters movie. They rent Pink Flamingos, they go home, they say, I got halfway through it. I know what that is, the singing sphincter muscle. And, but why don't they just turn it off? I mean, that's what I did when Forrest Gump started running. I mean, how long has he been doing it? 25, 20, 20 years. Yeah, so, so I feel that there's gonna be, there's gonna be changes and, and it's, not a, it's not a bad thing or a good thing. Um, and I, so yeah, I, I, I see differences, but, but I think anyone who's had 30 years of living, there's mm -hmm. going to be, there's going to be some differences, you know, um, I just find them interesting, you know, his, his evolution. The times are different. They don't have midnight. If I did make films completely like I used to, <laughs> they wouldn't play because they don't have midnight movies anymore. Things are radically different. Um, if you have a, an independent film now, it has to show with a big budget for ads, no matter even if it costs $10. Well, now this is, she's upstairs for everyone, so it comes back to this. Okay, why don't you be sitting over there on the couch, Roland? And you stay where you are, looking at the presents, you know.
were mornings when I would wake up to go to film, and you'd look outside, and it'd be pitch outside, and you, think, and you felt like you had just closed your eyes five minutes before. And you really didn't rest that well that night anyway, because you keep going over your lines in your sleep. Uh, maybe that's the, the most important, just waking up and realizing that there's a whole day ahead of you, and you don't know how long that day will be. Before we open again. Oh, Mother. Ah, come on, Dawn. It adds to the spirit. Right away, start. Oh, not on Christmas. Don't do this to us, Dawn. Can't you see you're breaking our hearts? You're lucky it's not your neck. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. One of the, the, the great things that, that John Waters always delivers in a movie is just, you know, the sort of perfect American iconography of trash. And... Christmas is, you know, I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, but it's really become the trash, you know, the trash holiday of the entire year. Christmas was always sort of the classic Circean, you know, sort of schmalsy Circean uh, piece of, you know, iconography in the movies. And I think sort of when, when Divine, you know, has her fit in front of the Christmas tree, I mean, somehow it just seemed, you know, so perfectly Circean. And it should have been a, a Circean mirror, you know, in the background with Divine's profile in black as this, as this happened. Well, a typical middle-class Christmas in America is maybe one of the best days of the year, if they can get through it without a fight. Yeah, it's Circean. It certainly it builds up unreasonable hopes of how good can it be. It's not going to solve all your problems all year of unhappiness. But um, no, I think it's um, it's the best sleep you can have is after a nice Christmas with your family and lucky that you could do that and that you got through the whole year. No, I, I don't think Christmas is one bit depressing. I think if it is, you should kill yourself. The first thing that I saw of John's um, was probably like around 1981 or maybe 1980. I, I was uh, working for the f fire department as a f firefighter, and one night, you know, like at two o'clock in the morning, I was on house watch and I'm watching uh, the TV, some cable show, and there was a scene from uh, Female tr Troubles on, and I didn't know what I was watching. It was a scene where Divine was um, having a fight with her parents and then knocks over the Christmas tree. And um, I just remember looking at this, you know, just thinking, what is this? And not being able to change it. I mean, it, it, was, I mean, it was so weird, uh, but, I, but I had to watch. And, uh, and I thought Divine was amazing. Action. Get off me, you ugly witch! You devil! Come here, you pay for this! You'll pay for this, Dawn, oh, Devil Ball! Okay, so hold it right where it is. All right, let's just get a close up of our land. <laughs> okay, good. To me, the most iconographic one in my memory is in Female Trouble, when Divine pulls the Christmas tree down on her mother and runs out of the house screaming, fuck you, fuck you, because she didn't get cha-cha heels for Christmas, which is one, that's the scene that sticks in my head much more than, the, the, than uh, Divine eating the shit. Hideous as it may be by, by any sort of official cultural standard, there is a fabulous sensibility here that is mining the, the depths, the dregs of society and finding not necessarily beauty, but a kind of spiritual wonderment uh, that I think infuses that movie and makes it something far beyond just bad taste. He's a perfect gentleman, really. Um... He's very, and I think that his movies, the ones that I've seen, reflect this. They are outrageous, and uh, and his interests are perverse and um, odd and all of that stuff. But but he has no, uh, there's no meanness about him. There's no desire to, dis you know, he wants to shock you without disturbing you or. Um, or outrage you without offending you or something. There's a kind of kindliness about it all. And I think it's in his personality, too. One thing I must say that struck me that I still think is extraordinarily true of John Waters' work is he has an incredibly kind heart. He will never, I mean, he takes these very bizarre characters who aren't, who aren't necessarily very attractive, either physically or emotionally, 
uh, and he makes you care about them. And in my own working with him, it was very clear that although he wouldn't hesitate to, you know, to find your sort of vulnerable spot, if he thought he hurt you, that was it. He would back off. He would never, he was never malicious, never, never unkind, uh, consciously unkind to anyone. And I think this quality of, of caring for people, no matter what they look like or what they seem to be, is one of his greatest gifts. And my wife has always had a crush on him. She's always, she was, she was always trying to get me to grow a pencil thin, you know. Because I used to slick my hair back. I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I get mistaken for him. I've actually signed autographs as John Waters. You know, um, and John and I ha actually have a running joke about who's going to play the Don Knotts story, me or him. I think I should play Don Knotts and he should direct it. I'm still trying to angle a way to be in a John Waters film. I think I either have to play Don Knotts or I have to play John. I could play, there should be a TV movie about John Waters. And I should play John.